thank you so much for the warm welcome. Bishop John welcomed me last evening. And Jason, I thank you so much for the warm welcome last evening. Bishop Frank, thank you so very, very much. It's just been coming through across a, fresh, a threshold and seeing these wonderful, warm, smiling faces. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And all I can say is thank you, thank you so very, very much. My eagerness, my hope, is in these next few days and weeks and months and years to come more and more to know the beauty of the church here in New Hampshire. To see the faith that lives. To see the people who make their homes and their lives and their futures and hand on great tradition and a very, very great love for God's country. The natural beauty in this state. And as I was saying earlier, come in and see in all the mills along the river, the history that's there of people who really did begin and gave so much, and in many instances, even physically, to know you worked in the mills, didn't you? Yeah, this is what we do. And all of the wonderful, wonderful experiences that I need yet to know, yet to learn, and to share in God's grace. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very, very much. But now I'm going to read a little bit of a text, okay? <laughs> in, 19, in, in 2007, in the year 2007, I was told that I was chosen to be an auxiliary bishop for the Diocese of Rockville Center. Hearing that news was very overwhelming, to be called to be a bishop. And so, thinking that nobody even knew who I was as priest in my diocese, doing the things that I was doing, taking care of parishes, to be asked to be an auxiliary bishop was just more than I was ready for. And everyone was, again, so very, very, very kind. But now, four years later, I've been called yet again, but now to be bishop and shepherd of the church, the household of faith, in what will be for me a new home, a new family, a new beginning in grace. I'm coming eagerly to the Diocese of Manchester and the state of New Hampshire, and I desire so much to meet all of you, to see Christ so alive and present in you. I desire so much to share in this work of ours, to be true to and thus to carry on the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is who we are, this is what we do, and it makes such a richness in the world and our standing together as God's people can only glorify God and bring goodness. I remember well, and I'm thankful for the words of a formula memorized so long ago, when we were just little kids in school. Why did God make you? God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. It's a formula, and they are words that we really remember. But when they're lived, when we deepen our knowledge and understanding of the sacred scriptures, when Holy Eucharist and all the sacraments become more and more a cause of joy, and when caring for each person's dignity and well-being is not a labor, but true compassion and care for neighbor, that formula comes alive, and now we see this is who we are, this is what we are, why we are. And then, of course, the formula finished up, to be happy with God forever in heaven, knowing that there is yet more, and our immortal soul continuing to live on in God's glory. This here, this here, brings even yet more ennobling richness to us. So these are the things that are in my heart, and as bishop, as priest, as believer, I do bring so very much with me everywhere I go. I'm deeply grateful to Bishop McCormick for your years of ministry, witness, shepherding, your love for these people, and their love for you. I hope to carry on as successor with an open heart, open door, and a place always set at table. <laughs> and many, many, many opportunities to talk and to hear, Bishop. Thank you, thank you so very, very, very much yet again. Thank you, God bless. Thank you. Thank you.
looking so forward to learning so much from you, working with you. You will guide me very, very much, I pray, and I look forward to it. Been very, very kind already, very, very welcoming. Thank you. And very encouraging to us. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, we will always be grateful. I'm grateful to Almighty God, who's brought me into being, to my parents who gave me life, to my family, friends, and my Holy Catholic Church, all who have sustained me to this very hour. Bishop Murphy, my diocesan bishop in Rockville Center, my brother priests and deacons, all the lay faithful, the consecrated men and women religious, all whom I was privileged to serve as priest, and then as auxiliary bishop in that diocese since my priestly ordination in 1978. I am utterly and deeply grateful to our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, who has entrusted me with this ministry. I have asked him in writing, especially for his prayers, that I may fulfill the duties of this sacred office to which I've been called as a good shepherd, a good priest, a good bishop, a good steward of the household of faith here in this wonderful place. And may the Lord God remember all of us in his kingdom, now and ever and forever. Amen. Amen. And so, again, I thank you. <coughs> and please, God, let us glorify God and let God glorify us as we live the faith together and we grow as citizens of this great state as well. God bless you. Any questions? Yes. Hi, Holly Raymar from the Associated Press. Very nice to meet you. Could you please just describe some of the, the challenges you see in, in coming to New Hampshire and, and what your approach will be? My first challenge is going to be to listen very carefully. Mm -hmm. It'll be very important for me to learn, to spend time, here and coming to know all the more the, the, the culture, the life, everything that is taught here. And so that will be my greatest goal, is first of all to, to come to know and to learn. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? You're just afraid I'm going to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what are your goals for the diocese? <clears throat> Again, that is something I'm going to want to find as we grow, as I, I spend time with Bishop and as I spend more time with all the members of the, the cabinet and those who are already responsibly leading the diocese, as they have with Bishop John, I need to take time to really see what's going to be the most important things, what to do, and the direction of the diocese. So I can't establish goals at this moment, but very eagerly will be looking forward to, to do that as they become very, very apparent. Thanks. So have you ever spent any time in New Hampshire before? I have visited briefly several times, but not as uh, a citizen, as you would say. Okay. So as I've come, I've just seen some of the very, very nice beauty, the, much, the, the great beauty here, but only have spent a little bit of time on occasion. Yes? Quick question, Howard Rosen from National Catch. And I was just curious about what kind of uh, community you're leaving, what kind of uh, Irish or you know, community have you been serving? How would you describe that community? Very good. <laughs> Most recently? Uh, my parish, I was living in residence in Southampton, Long Island. And so when you speak of the Hamptons, many people will have a, an image. Well, I tell you, you could walk just a little bit to the Shinnecock Indian Reservation, members of the Algonquin Federation, and we had the, um, I guess what you would call the gathering of the Hispanic ministry for the South Fork was there on, on our property because we have a tremendous, tremendous immigrant population there. And we have many... Uh, really religions, faiths, creeds, all living there together. It's quite a, a heterogeneous area, uh, all socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's a, it a wonderful place to be. And important, as I say, you know, it's interesting. You do learn when you're in a particular place after a while that what you may have imagined, oh, there's a whole lot more. And so that's the kind of place I've come from and eager now to continue. Thank you. Pleasure, thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? One of the issues that always faces bishops is the, 
uh, sexual abuse cases in the church. How do you plan to approach that as the bishop of this diocese? Thank you for asking that. The most important thing right off the bat is the compassion, the compassion, and the desire to heal, to help, to restore, to heal, and to again rebuild individual lives, family lives, life of the church, life of the community. So important, and that will be a very, very important part of my life. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. I'm Kathy Marchaki with Union Leader. What attributes do you bring in terms of a healer? I mean, in past experience, or how? what do you special bring here? What I try to do, and uh, if I could give you a, a for instance, perhaps, there was a parish in our diocese that was going through some very, very difficult times. Their church had begun to, to crumble physically, and the parish became very, very divided. Should we tear down the church, build a new church, what should we do, this and that? And over time, it became less and less possible to find anyone who would go as a pastor. Well, after a number of years, I said, well, I don't know if I can do anything, but I'll, I'll just try. So I offered to go, and they said, Peter, are you sure you want this? Because if you, if you put your name in, you're going to get it. <laughs> so I said, well, all right. <laughs> and so I did, eventually, I was given the assignment as pastor of the parish. And all I can tell you is that going in, it was a tough beginning. People didn't know what to, to do, and for nine months, mostly people would look at me and turn away because they were not sure who to trust. But I will never forget when I offered to say mass for the Boy Scouts on a camp out. The fellow who was in charge of the, the scouts, he said, you'd be willing to do that? I said, sure, why not? Of course we do that. I never heard of that. And that was the beginning of a great change. And this one, and this one, and this one. We began to work on the church, came to a consensus. The town all came together again. I don't like to talk about this too much, but just to say that they restored their life together. And where once it was just so awful, they all said, we have something now. The church was built. A new church, we said we're going to go as close to the original as we can. We, we had to be as transparent as, I mean, that's just so important. And we had a model made. They saw what we were going to do. They said, we'll support this. The church is up, it's running, the community is strong and growing. And God is so good. Because everybody was looking for that. They found it. And God said, now you go do it. And so those kind of things, I suppose, would be listening, hoping, praying, believing. My motto is arise and walk. That's on my coat of arms. It comes from the act. See, once you get me started, I don't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> It comes from the Acts of the Apostles, where Peter and John, they were going up to the, the temple to pray. There was a beggar hoping for some money. And they said, well, we have neither silver nor gold. I have neither silver nor gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, arise and walk. I've taken that as my motto, just the three last words, arise and walk. When you're paralyzed by fear, in the name of Jesus Christ, let's try this. We can do this. When we don't know what to do, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, arise and walk. Let's, we can do this. And so that's pretty much what I try to bring. My faith in our Lord, my trust and hope, and my knowledge from experience that this is what people want. 